Hi there, Dr. Christensen here. A question we get all the time is, what should I look for in a protein shake? And it, it's an important thing, you know, protein shakes are so handy. Uh, getting a good dose of protein in the morning makes a huge difference for your day's energy, less cravings, burning fat better. But there's a million on the market and so many variables to think about. I want to give you guys some strategies so you can feel confident going anywhere and picking out something that's going to work out really good for you. First thing is, what is the source of the protein? You know, first thing to consider. There's many options out there. There are some uh, proteins that come from dairy, uh, casein and whey are the big ones. There are some animal-based protein. Collagen is the most common one there. And there's many plant-based proteins. So we've got soy, rice, hemp, pea, a few more odds and ends, uh, cranberry you see occasionally. Dairy, for starters, I would avoid and here's why. Uh, many have obvious dairy intolerances. You know, no secret there. There's whey and there's casein, the two main dairy proteins. So who's heard of Little Miss Muffet? You know, the curds and the whey, right? So when you, make, when you make cheese, the liquid, the lactose is separated, and then the whey is separated, and the curds are what's left. So curds are casein, whey is the watery protein, but they're both dairy-derived. Now the casein, the thick stuff, it's just hard to digest. So casein is actually a lot like Elmer's wood glue. It's the same, the same active ingredient. So you don't want that in your body. Whey is more digestible, but there's more data saying that some are also intolerant to it. And a concern too is, even if you are not, this is something that we want to make a really good habit. This is something you want to really do on a regular basis. And a daily frequent food dense in protein really runs the risk of becoming reactive even if it's not reactive. The other thought process is we're always concerned about wastes, contaminants, pesticides from our food sources, and that's even more important for animal foods, like, like dairy products, dairy derivatives. So for a daily thing, I wouldn't do that. You know, here and there, those that are not reactive, some dairy may be an option, but I wouldn't go out of your way to get protein-dense dairy on a daily basis. You're just gonna be getting stuff added to your body and things you could sensitize to. Uh, the other cow-based one we'll see is collagen protein, hydrolyzed collagen. And this is primarily derived from, from bone and connective tissues, tendons and ligaments from cows. Uh, it's high quality protein, it's well absorbed. The problem is lead contamination. And we see this all the time with bone compounds. So lead is kind of like calcium's nasty, evil cousin. <laughs> Wherever calcium goes, lead goes too. And cows have exposures to lead from, from feed, from environment, from pesticide residues, and they bioaccumulate it in their connective tissues. So bone material, collagen material, it has always lead contamination. And that gets into your body and stays there. So some types have been talked about for being cleaner than others, but being low lead collagen is kind of like being the tallest building in Kansas. <laughs> it's, not, it's not really a standout because the whole category has an issue. So let's go on to other vegetable-based proteins. We have rice protein, and I'm a fan of rice protein as an ingredient, but not as a standalone. As a standalone, it doesn't have really the best amino acid profile. There has been talk about arsenic as well. That is something that with testing with good brands, not as big of a factor, but the protein profile, the amino acid profile, is not perfect on rice only. Then we have others like, like hemp or berry proteins or seed-based ones, and you know, same thing there. We don't have the complete spectrum of amino acids. They may be a little less absorbed. So my favorite would be pea or pea in combination with rice. And the newer versions of this have the proteins without any binding compounds. So they're well absorbed, they're well assimilated, and they have high quality protein ratings. They do the job of rebuilding tissues very effectively. The other big vegetable protein would, would be soy. And soy protein, as, as an isolate, that's something that it does have isoflavones. And isoflavones are elements of soy that are hormonally active. You know, they, they do have hormonal effects. And there is debate back and forth as to whether those are good effects or bad effects. And it may be situation by situation. Isoflavones are clearly problematic 
for those who have autoimmune thyroiditis. And those who don't have autoimmune thyroiditis may have a latent version of it. So I do avoid isoflavones. So better, better to really just minimize. There are other versions of soy that are fermented that are less questionable, but the soy protein isolates do come from non-fermented soy by definition. So do avoid soy protein too. So yeah, pea, pea rice combos, those are probably your best bet as far as high quality protein, good taste, no big contaminants, and no big issues for allergenicity. No real problems that, that, way, that way. When picking up protein powders, Think a lot about sweeteners and flavorings too. You know, it's crazy. You're, you're being healthy. You're not drinking soda. You're avoiding sugars. Well, don't put sugar in your nutritional foods, the foods you're going out of your way to have for your health. You really want to avoid sugar in those. And there are small amounts you might find from naturally occurring sources, like if there's berries added in or if there's pectin that's present that's naturally occurring, that's different. But things like the evaporated cane juice, that's sugar. That's another name for sugar. It's no different. Or just sugar by itself. There's a lot of other natural sugars, the uh, agave, nectar, the coconut sugars. I would avoid those still. Those are still glycemically active. So, so pectin, fruits, naturally occurring sugars, those are molecularly distinct. They've not been refined, they've not been chemically isolated, and they're metabolized very differently by your body. I would make a distinction between that and uh, fruit sweeteners or fruit juice concentrate, which is a tricky way of saying fructose, just pure fructose. <laughs> a couple natural sweeteners that are fine. <clears throat> Stevia is not a problem. Uh, Lohan, which is similar. They're both herbs that have a sweet taste, but really no calories and no big effect on blood sugar. And I've seen a few products with smaller amounts of xylitol. That's probably a fine thing too. In high doses, it can act as a laxative. So do bear that one in mind. But small amounts of it, not, not a big problem. So think about the proteins. Think about the sweeteners. Think about the sugars. Also consider serving size and quantity of servings. You know, this is something that you want to be a good healthy habit, you know, part of your repertoire of things that keeps you thriving or moves you to it. And, and honestly, I encourage you to pay attention to cost factors. You know, look at what it costs per serving. And it's funny because sometimes the same size containers could be completely different for servings. I've seen some to where, you know, their standard size jug might be 12 servings and other mixtures, the exact same size jug might be 28 servings. <laughs> so when that's the case, you've got to really compare cost per serving. And also think about that in lines of, you know, what would this happen? What would this cost be if you were buying or making a breakfast? Or if you were missing a breakfast and then having more food afterwards and wrecking your health, how much does that cost? <laughs> so think about the real cost, the extended cost of it. And in that context, consider cost per serving as well. And always with your ingredients, be aware of just qualities overall. Uh, in many cases, things that you'll get at large, large stores, you know, large chains or franchises, it's really based upon lowest common material cost for them. Not always as much cost into quality considerations. Um, another thing to think about would be micronutrients. So vitamins, minerals, there's oftentimes many that are added in. And I would argue that they're mostly there for cosmetic purposes. They're there to make you think that it's helpful or powerful, but they're not always important parts of that. And I would argue that to some point they get to be very counterproductive. A couple of big micronutrients that are smart to avoid would be folic acid and iodine. Folic acid, we need folate Folic acid actually jams that same pathway for many people, and it's counterproductive. Iodine, we need a trace, but extra amounts above what we get all the time slows the thyroid. And overall, the ones that have a big list of vitamins and minerals, you know, they're going to get in the way of your multivitamin. It's going to be too much of that kind of stuff and it's going to overlap and compete with a multivitamin. Or if you skip the multi, then it just won't be enough in general. So I like ones that are really pared down to the key, the key nutritional needs that are required, especially the protein. Um, the other big factor would be fiber content. So you really want foods that digest slowly in the morning. That sets the stage for the whole day's metabolic rate.
Look for at least four or five or more grams of fiber in a protein shake uh, or add it in separately. You know, when they're built in, it's convenient. I really love the idea of resistant fiber. That's the kind of fiber that does the most good and that helps you stabilize your blood sugar so you can burn fat more effectively and have higher energy. So that's a great one to include, great one to have. But overall, you do want to have fiber present. Minerals, you know, some are useful, especially magnesium. There's almost always a role for a few extra milligrams of magnesium. But beyond that, again, you shouldn't overlap or compete with the multivitamin too much. And then there's a lot of kind of functional foods or herbs or um, fruit vegetable combos you'll see. In most cases, the amounts of those are so small that they're not biologically active and they may affect the cost of the product. They won't really affect your benefits. So I kind of like to avoid those things as well. Last thing I'll mention would be probiotics. They certainly help our health. It's good to have the right flora, but they're not very stable in powders. So I wouldn't really put a lot more value in powders that have probiotics. And if anything, they tend not to be as biologically active when they're in that format and they're exposed to so much air. So also a good thing to look at and work around. So overall, you really want those that have high quality protein, pea, pea rice combos. Those are probably the best for not being allergenistic, very, very biologically active and not being contaminated. You want ones that taste good and that have some real simple flavorings. You know, vanilla, chocolate, most don't stray too far from that because those are universal tastes. The things you have day in and day out, it's pretty easy to get sick of if the taste is too distinct or too powerful. So the better shakes, you can just take, add some cold water in a little mixer, mixing jar and call it good. It shouldn't take much more than that. In the days you're really busy and on the go, that can be your breakfast. You know, mixed up, done, ready, all set. There are times where you may want to just like really make the flavors your own or work in some more foods. And the better ones have a bit of a neutral enough taste to where that's totally fine. If you do that, but one of the first things I would prioritize would be some greens. Believe it or not, some frozen spinach, some frozen kale, you'll never even know it's in there. <laughs> it might slightly affect the color, but no effect upon flavor. So that's one easy add-in. A few frozen berries can work really well too. You know, some type of a non-dairy milk, if you like more of a base. My personal favorite that way, would be the unsweetened flax milk. It's very low in calories, like 25 calories per cup, but also you're getting some essential fats out of that. And the last thing you might think to include would be just a few seeds, also for more fiber and more texture. Of course, chia works great. Flax can be real nice. Hemp can be good in those. And think about those as more essential fats, fiber, not a big shift on the protein content, but helping to fortify in other ways. So overall, those are things to look for. You know, shakes are a great habit, and I'd really encourage you to find blends that meet those criteria that pass your taste test <laughs> that you love, and you can make part of your daily habit to move you back to great health. Thanks so much. We'll talk in real soon.